if you want to inspire someone you can say something inspirational if you want to motivate someone you can say something motivational if you want to romance someone you can write a love poem but if you want to change someone you have to get into the truth you have to touch their core because the core is the thing that's changing and I think the layers that I had to break for myself is okay this is what I want to say this is the layer of ego underneath it this is the layer of shyness underneath it what happens when I break that ego what happens when I break that shyness you find the truth all right thank you for coming to the podcast Sophia how are you today I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Much appreciated. As we're kicking things off here, uh, I want to start off like, well, the interview is primarily going to focus on your spirit, your poetry, your spoken word, and that sort of thing. Um, my first major exposure, I should say, I mean, I've seen spoken word and that kind of thing on YouTube and clips here and there, but I'd say my first major, major exposure was I went to an event a few years ago in Brixton. It was a spoken word um, meetup. And then what I liked, and I went there a few times afterwards, and what I like about spoken word is the, you know, that, that rawness you get with it, that it yeah. hits you in a different type of way compared to, I love music. I'm listening to music like 24 seven. Of course, music hits you, but I feel that spoken word is a lot more like poignant. You know what I'm saying? Like it hits you proper. And when I was listening to, listening to your stuff, I was getting that same type of feel. It's like that, that deep stuff, it hits you proper, you know, um, to kick things off. I'm just wondering, so let's talk, like, very generally speaking, actually, can you talk about any kind of, any specific moment in your life that inspired one of your most powerful poems? So what that pow- what that poem was that comes to your head, and then what period in your life inspired that particular piece? You know, I think, um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is my final answer, but the first thing that comes to my head, I I was songwriting with a friend of mine, and she's got an amazing voice. We went to school together. Um, she used to do musical theatre in school. So she's always had an amazing voice. Um, and she wanted to pursue music, but she was scared or she didn't know where to start. So I said, cool, let's have a songwriting session. And we ended up writing this song and poem all about purpose, all about the importance of trusting that the thing that is put inside you whether it's your passion, whether it's your interest, whether it's just something you're really, really good at, it was put there for a reason. And when you water that seed, it will grow. Um, And we wrote about this, and I think every time I perform that poem, it always seems to touch at least one person in the audience, but more than that, it always seems to remind me that actually, I think I'm a Christian, and I think it's really important to be obedient to your purpose, to be obedient to the things that your spirit is asking you to do. If it's asking you to move country, if it's asking you to travel, if it's asking you to write poetry, if it's asking you to start the business, if it's whatever it's asking you to do, I think it's really obedient, really good to be obedient and make that thing your compass. So every time I'm performing it, I'm just remembering, cool, this thing that I'm walking in was already written. This path that I'm on was already laid out before me. Um, and there's so much power on the other side of stepping into your potential. Um, and I think that poem is just a reminder of that to me every time I perform it, every time someone talks to me about it. That poem, was that, was that your first poem that you, or poem slash song that you put together? And also on top of that, you spoke about stepping into your purpose. Did you know that in you doing that, you were stepping into your purpose? Um, your first question, it wasn't my first poem. My first poem was whack. It was like... I got on stage with just a drummer and that is that's not a poetry setup <laughs> unless it's like the talking drum which again is not my style of like oral communication um so it was me and a drummer and he was playing like the Jesus walks beat the dun 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 so he was doing that um and I'll come on stage like that was the beat that rose like the heat that made its way from my ground to my and it was so bad but at the time <laughs> at the time do you know what? I don't even think I thought it was that good at the time but I remember loving the feeling of performing and I think I just continued to chase that um and I think to answer your second question I actually think one thing I've learned anyway is that sometimes we chase a big feeling sometimes we chase happiness sometimes we chase joy but oftentimes the places we stay are where we find comfort oftentimes the places we stay are where we find the ability to just default be ourselves 
And when I first started doing poetry and I was writing, it wasn't that I was in love with the writing process. It wasn't that I was in love with like finding rhyming words. I do love poetry, but it was more that when I got on stage, I felt a level of peace and I feel a level of comfort that I don't really feel in other places. Um, I actually can't remember what your second question was, but maybe that answers it. No, that's that. It, it does. In fact, my second question was when you done that piece of your friend, was did you know that you're stepping into your purpose then? But it seems as if it's um you started that journey a bit earlier on, anyways, with that Jesus walk. That sounds like it was bumping, anyways. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I thought so at the time, but yeah, I, I might not do that again as an adult, you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and it's interesting you talk about when oftentimes where we say is um, that position of comfort. Because it got me thinking of a quote, and I cannot remember who said this quote, because I read it I read it fairly recently as well, but someone anyway said that what is it? there's no growth in the comfort zone. And then mm. when you're wanting to grow, you need to be uncomfortable. I'm really butchering the quote, but I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> said that same kind of thing anyway. So like, for example, yeah. if you go in the gym and you're pushing and you're feeling that pain, that means, you know, there's growth there, you're uncomfortable. When you're running and you're tired and you're panting, whatever, it's uncomfortable, but there's growth there. And yeah with you um it's, it's sort of like in slight like a juxtaposition to what you said there about you feeling comfortable on stage have you ever had to push yourself out of your comfort zone to grow as an artist yeah i think i completely agree with what you said i think everything in the world is tension and release from breathing breathing is like <laughs> tension and then release to music like the music is about the silences the silences make the music um if you look at like a flower blooming it has to break out of the seed to bloom if you look at um just like as people we grow your skin breaks every single time you grow you know so i think everything has to break to grow um and i think it's tension and release and i think i don't have this fear of i think with me we're probably the breaking happened is that I have to break layers of myself to get to the truth of what I'm saying, because I have this understanding that people connect to the truth. People can connect to all kinds of things. Don't get me wrong. But if you want to, if you want to inspire someone, you can say something inspirational. If you want to motivate someone, you can say something motivational. If you want to romance someone, you can write a love poem. But if you want to change someone, you have to get into the truth. You have to touch their core because the core is the thing that's changing. And I think, the layers that I had to break for myself is, okay, this is what I want to say. This is the layer of ego underneath it. This is the layer of shyness underneath it. What happens when I break that ego? What happens when I break that shyness? You find the truth. Um, so I think that was my breaking. I think I often get asked, like, how do you go on stage and be so, so, so vulnerable? And it's funny because in my day to day, it's not necessarily my personality. I'm not saying I'm a closed book, but I'm not as open as I am on stage. Mm. <laughs> And I always say, like, my more than I care about someone looking at me like I'm weak or looking at me like I'm too sensitive, I care about someone else who's going through a similar situation, connecting and hopefully feeling like they're either not alone or there's a way out of their situation. And I think in order to do that, you have to break yourself to a level of truth, to a level of honesty that can impact someone else who's going through that thing. Otherwise, for me, what's the point? Yeah, yeah, I agree on that vulnerability piece as well. I feel like in order to really, really connect with your audience and your people that are listening, you're going to have to, you know, you need to, so like you said, break through those layers of truth and feel, people need to feel like you're speaking very directly to them. It's like if you're speaking to everyone, you're speaking to nobody. But if you're speaking very specifically to someone about some deep stuff that they feel deep down within them, it's going to hit them a lot more. And, and I was listening to your TED talk, the the second, I think it's the second one, the second one, the one about, oh, I've forgotten the name, but um, about breaking out of the norm, um, ordinary, I've forgotten the exact name for it. Um, but I was listening to it and you had a piece at the end and you spoke about heartbreak. And again, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's something <laughs> along the lines of how uh, the, the heartbreak was good, but you don't want to experience that kind of heartbreak again because you don't know what it's going to do to you. And... And I was listening, I'm like, that's, it's deep. It's a level of vulnerability that you don't hear all the time in everyday life. You know, you don't hear people, friends, peers, whatever, speak in such a vulnerable manner. But when you hear you perform it in such a way, it hits and it hits deeper. Um, and yeah, I think it's just so important, you know, to be able to open up and to be as vulnerable as you com feel comfortable being anyway on stage to really, really connect with people. Is that something that you've started to, find a bit easier 
over time or is it something you still struggle with you still feel very uncomfortable and struggle with even now do you know what I don't think I struggle with it anymore I actually feel like I'm learning more about not everything needs to be said <laughs> I think I'm on I'm on the other side of it I, I don't have a problem getting really honest I think I have a really clear passage um between like how I'm feeling and what I say I don't think I try and sugarcoat things anymore I don't think I try and like make if I'm talking about a feeling of being heartbroken it serves no one to pretend to be strong you know it serves no one who's going through heartbreak to for me to be delivering something that's just a little bit dishonest you know um so I think like getting really honest getting really vulnerable in poetry I actually have trained to the point where kind of like a an athlete you know if they're training for four times a week on the fifth day they can go go through a jog without worrying right so I think it's very much that but I'm also learning how to be responsible with my own feelings and be responsible with my own truths because not every stage is an arena for you to tell everything that you're going through <laughs> and mm. that's definitely something I'm learning so what do you do now then to try and grow as an artist um I read a lot I read a lot so I'm always reading things that come from different spaces so if I'm talking about the issue of race for example I don't just want to look at race in context of black Britons I don't want to just look at race in context of diasporans from either Southeast Asia or West Africa, which are my backgrounds. I want to look at the culture of race globally. I want to look at the history of race globally and I want to see what things have connected us, what things have divided us. So I think I try to read really wide. Um, and I think the wider you read, the more perspectives you gain, the more compassionate you're forced to become, the more forgiving you become as well. Um, so I read a lot. I go to a lot of shows when I can as well. Um, I'm always just consuming art I'm always consuming art but I think probably the main thing that informs my poetry is that I have a lot of conversations I'm naturally quite a curious person um, and I'm trying to be an even more curious person um, because I think when you're curious you're slower to be judgmental as well when you're curious you're more inclined to find a reason to be compassionate you're more inclined to find a reason to be understanding um, but I don't necessarily think we're from a generation of celebrating curiosity. I actually think we're in a space where everyone's expected to know where they stand, what they believe in, what side of the spectrum they're on, to have language to justify whatever it might be. But I don't think there's space to grow if you're forced to always know where you're standing. You know, I think actually you have to grow by growing and you have to grow by being curious. So I try to stay curious. When on that last week you spoke about River, where we don't necessarily live in a culture that celebrates that curiosity. And, and that sort of takes me back to that TED talk again, which was some time back, well, it was uploaded six years ago. Uh, so it's still some time back, but then there you're talking about how we're expected to fit within certain modes, i.e., you know, don't be curious, don't step out of that certain mode. So as a mixed race woman, you're expected to be vegan and this and that, wherever, wherever. As a black man, I might be expected to like rap music or do this or do that, whatever. I just sort of stereotypes basically. Um, which uh, society sometimes tries to box us within, tries to place us within. That talk from six years ago up until now, do you see any shift in that sort of societal mentality and thinking behind, or yeah, do you see any shift in, you know, with, in people you interact with or in your life or whatnot? Or do you feel that we're still in the same place or, same place, or have things got even worse, maybe with the rise of social media and things like that? Do you know what? I do think there's been a shift. I think there's either been a shift or I just care less. But it's also, <laughs> it could be both. I think that um, people are more, because so many people, more people are online now, I think people are getting access to actually how other people can live. People are finding communities. So let's say you're a black guy and let's say the assumption is like rap music, hip hop. Let's say you were really into like Beethoven and really into like really, really into classical music, that was your thing. I think because we're online, people are finding their communities a lot more easily than you would when you didn't have an online. You only have the people around you physically when, you, when you're not online, right? So I think in people finding their communities, I think people from outside those communities are actually looking and realizing, oh, um, one, it's not one hat for everyone, you know? Um, I do think, don't get me wrong, it's slow progress because I was saying it to my friend the other day, there are some summons in London where other than my management team, I'm not talking to, the only people I'm speaking to are black. 
and this can be like for months at a time the only people i'm engaging with are black and black people are the minority let alone someone who's part of the majority in the uk chances are so many people get to 80 90 and they've never had a conversation with a black person so their idea of blackness is going to be linked and attributed to what they see and what they remember and oftentimes that's on the news whatever it might be um so i do think there's a way to go definitely but in fact even the other day i was at lunch with a friend of mine and he was flying a business class having a conversation with a white woman he's a black guy and after they had a con they were speaking about all sorts history race no not race sorry history america a bunch of things and she turned around to him afterwards and was like you're just so articulate and he wasn't offended by it, but he did raise the question to her, if I look like this guy over here, and he pointed to someone else that was in business class, would you have said that I was articulate? And she probably, she probably didn't mean anything offensive by it. She probably just ex didn't expect someone who looked like him to be articulate to the degree that he was. And I think that's unconscious bias. I think that's just, you've never assumed or met someone from a certain community that acts in a way that you would otherwise only attribute to your own community. And I think the more conversations we have, the more walls we break down, um, those things are less likely to happen. But then I also think on the other side, why I said at the beginning, it's either people have changed or I care less. I think it's also really important that we care less because there is, at any given time, there's going to be a thousand voices no pun intended there's going, be, <laughs> there's going to be so many reasons um to feel like you have to prove yourself to someone there's going to be so many reasons to actually i'll go back and ask that lady why did you say that i'm articulate there's always going to be reasons you just have to step outside and have a conversation with someone who's never been a part of your community and you will find a reason to prove yourself but i actually think i don't think that's living i don't think it's fair to kind of trade off our skin or trade off our peace or trade off our just everyday existence for teaching someone else. I think there's a time and a place for it. And I think if some people uh, regard their life as the life of an activist or a martyr, fine, absolutely. But I do think we have to make our choice. And maybe two or three years ago, I was asked to write this, uh, ghost write this book. And it was a collection of essays on the history of race in the UK, primarily looking at Caribbean communities. And I remember it was like 67,000 words in like 21 days. So I was literally head down 3,000 words a day. Um, and that was it. That was me for like 21 days. It was literally just like a marathon. But because I was consuming so much about the history of race, the number of kids expelled from like the 80s up until now, Caribbean migration, the Caribbean and African relationships in the UK, um, to the gentrification of West London, Notting Hill, like all of these things, all of these things that were racist. When I then went outside, if someone in front of me crossed the road in front of me, I'm not seeing it for what it is. I'm seeing it for what I've read it is. I'm seeing it as they hold this bias and this bias was responsible for X, Y, Z and this, that, the other. And I realised that I became so uncomfortable in my own skin because I would walk into a room and if everyone's looking at me, I'm not thinking it's because I have big hair. I'm not thinking it's because I look good. I'm thinking it's because they've just never seen a black woman in this space. And that's not healthy. <laughs> it's not healthy because sometimes not everyone's racist, right? Not everyone is racist. And I think when you immerse yourself in the world of racism so much, it's just so easy to assume that everyone is. So I actually made a decision when I finished that book that I was gonna take a step back from a lot of the racial activism spaces that I would occupy. Um, because I realised that it was just ruining my existence. Like, I had no peace going out. I was going on my morning jog for peace, and instead I was thinking about all the reasons a woman might cross the road when she in front, if she's in front of me. And I don't think that serves anyone. Mm. Sorry, I went on the ramble. No, no, it's, it's all good. It's all good. Can you talk about what your personal experience has been like, or your journey, I should say, with you learning to embrace that, your, your uniqueness, and you just over time is learning not to care i suppose you ghostwriting that book was sounds like it was one major facet within you doing that but have you gone through any other experiences or would you attribute that kind of thing to childhood like what's that personal journey been like for you yeah do you know what it's actually been really interesting so my both of my parents are half west african so they both grew up in gambia and then my mum moved to sierra leone and then they came to london around the same time when they were like 18 19 20 
and we've always gone back to Gambia every year. Um, the culture that we've been raised in is very much Gambian culture, Gambian music, Gambian food, Gambian language. And we're also Southeast Asian. So my father's half Indian, my mom's half Sri Lankan. And, but they never raised us as Asian kids. <laughs> there was never any talk of like, if you ask my dad where he's from, he's gonna tell you he's black. If you ask my mom where she's from, she's gonna tell you she's black. And that's because they grew up in Africa. Do you know what I mean? But mixed race was not even a thing in Gambia. Like you were just Gambian, that's what it was. Mm. Um, and then I think when they came to London and they raised us this way, I've always kind of gone about my life f from my culture, you know, and that's never really changed because also we've never, we didn't know the Asian side until like a couple of years ago. So in my formative years, everything was really Gambian. And actually when we have a, a term in, in Wolof, Gambian language called Tibub, and that basically means white man. And my dad's like the same color as me. And they used to call him a Tibub growing up in Gambia, but he didn't, it, was, it wasn't offensive. It was just like, humor to everyone I guess so he's always kind of gone about his life and his business being aware that there's another side of him but not being so aware that it makes him insecure in the fact that he's Gambian and they very much raised us that way and actually it wasn't until maybe the last few years where we had the colorism argument a lot more and people are speaking about light skin privilege a lot more, hair textures, whatever it might be, that I've actually looked at myself through a different lens. And maybe it sounds quite dumb, but the other day, I've done like thousands of interviews. And for the first time last year, November, I was asked about what it was like being mixed race. And I'd never been asked that before, ever. And the question was, what do you enjoy most about being mixed race? And I didn't realize that I was scared to answer. I love my hair texture. I love my skin color. I love the color I go. I tan when I tan. I love that my mannerisms come from different places. I love that I've got like a curious wide palette of things I enjoy. Um, and I know a lot of that is attributed to dual identity that it's in me, not necessarily on me, but in me. Um, and I was just scared to answer because I had never looked at my identity as dual identity. I'd never looked at myself as half this, half that, because you can't be half, you can't, your blood doesn't stop halfway, you know what I mean? You're 100% this and 100% that, that's how it works. Um, so I actually think realising that identity is so nuanced, the concept of identity is constantly transforming and growing, like the notion of blackness, the more we read and the more we study, the notion of blackness transforms. When I first was on stage at 16, compared, to, and people were talking about racial discourse, pardon me, compared to the racial discourse that people talk about now, we've evolved we've evolved and we've grown so 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 much so i think the notion of identity is nuanced it's changing it's transforming and i think me making peace with that and making peace with that identity can be a journey as well i think i've just stopped caring a lot <laughs> because it's it's such a personal journey and you, you can i think it's important to also pick and choose what season of um what season of yourself you choose to represent as well and maybe that comes from a place of privilege, but I do think, I don't know, it was really important for me to make the decision to step back from racial activism for a bit, because I realised that it wasn't, in, the way that I was navigating it was not increasing compassion for my brother that looked different to me. It wasn't increasing forgiveness for, for a community that looked different to me. It was actually just making me really angry. And when you step into any kind of activism from a place of anger, the chances are you're not striving for equality, you're striving for overpowerment. And that's dangerous. Acting from a place of rage and not love is dangerous. And I think um, Bell Hooks talks about it in her book, All About Love. She says, one thing that is missing from so many social movements is the importance of love. Because if you are, if I'm fighting for you and I'm not doing it from a place of love, I'm doing it from a place of anger, I can kill the person that kills you because I'm doing it from a place of anger. If I'm doing it from a place of love, I'm more inclined to want to educate. I'm more inclined to want to inform. I'm more inclined to find a more peaceful approach to actually ensuring that we can all live like this, not necessarily like this. That being said, I think it's also extremely habitual and innate for people, if you've been oppressed, to want to overpower your oppressor. Do you know what I mean? I think, I think that's natural, I think that's habitual, but I think in protests, there's so many different stokes and everyone has to play a different role.
You need people that are going to burn down the police stations. You need people that are going to absolutely rule out anyone from outside the community, talking inside the community. You also need people that are going to lobby for parliament. And you also need humanitarians that are ready to go into the whitest of the whitest of the whitest, most racist space and go from a place of love. You need different people in a protest to make a movement. And I think I just identified who I was in in protest. And I think once I identified that... I could care a lot less about other things. So who would you say you are then in protest? I think I'm the humanitarian. <laughs> <laughs> I think like poetry is, like you said, it's such a gentle art form, but it's so poignant as well. Um, and I think it's so close to conversation and it's, it's all about storytelling. And I think if I can, I've got a Jewish neighbour and she's the other day, maybe like a few months ago, um, she came to a show that I did more than a few months ago. She came to the show that I did. I was helping her take her bins out a couple of days later. And then she was like, I was really impressed by your show. I've never seen so many coloured people do such cool things on stage. And obviously, I know people don't say coloured anymore. Mm. <laughs> she hasn't got a clue. Like, she's from Holocaust, um, the Holocaust era, right? So it that wasn't a thing. You know, they had their own things to deal with. So... Um, it took me actually, I was triggered at first and then she said it again another time and I was triggered and then eventually like I told her, people don't say that no more. Um, but I actually think, what was I even going to say? Yeah, I think me and my brother are different. I think, or my brothers even, I think one of my brothers, he might not have the temperament to sit down and explain why coloured is offensive now and people don't say it. He might just be like, cool, I'm not talking to her anymore because she's racist. That's it. Um, and he's well justified in that as well, you know, like it's, it's offensive at the end of the day. Um, but I think I do, I think the reason why I say I think I step into the humanitarian side of the protest is just because I've got a lot of patience for people. I've got a lot of patience for understanding people's why. If she's someone, if she was someone who had, who's been online, been engaged in racial cons, um, conversation and discourse, understands wrong and right of like, the semantics you used to discuss race and then she said it cool you're racist do you know what I mean but she hasn't got a clue <laughs> um so I think yeah I think I've got a lot of patience and grace um when it comes to having those uh, conversations yeah and to take it a step back when you're talking about the identity particularly from a mixed race person's lens and you having not been asked that question over how many interviews hundreds thousands of interviews you've done and only been so forced to think about and confront it at that moment in time when you asked it back then so with you you've grown up with your parents who have both uh, grown up in the west african context etc and you've only sort of tapped into the other side of your family or the, the asian side of your heritage in more recent times would you say you've had uh, a mixed race person's experience if there is a mixed race person's experience um do you know what i would have i would have previously just said no just because i've stood inside myself and felt black right um but i remember a couple of years ago i was sat with two of my girls we went to high school together and they're both um dark skinned black girls and i was basically explaining what i've just said to you i was like um in high school, like, I don't think things were differentiated. Like, I wasn't the lighty in high school, this, that, the other. And they both kind of looked at me and they were just like, you definitely got treated different because you were light-skinned. And then I looked at them and I was like, now I know they're lying because I was just some little ugly, like, boyish tomboy <laughs> in school. And if I got treated differently, it was probably because of that. And people didn't treat me better. They probably treated me worse. <laughs> um, but I think they were more talking about when we all go out now and obviously like sometimes things can happen on nights out, whatever it might be. Um, but I think, don't get me wrong, I don't see myself through other people's eyes. I don't know what people see that then um, helps them make the decision as to how to treat me. It could be my race, it could be my hair, it could be being exotic, whatever it might be. It could be any of these things. Um, and I'm sure like in a lot of places I'm palatable. I'm sure in a lot of the campaigns I've done or brands that I've worked with, I am palatable, but given that what I do, I'm not a model, right? I'm not um, an influencer as such. Um, my laurels are built on what I create. My laurels are built on how I think, how I reason things, how I tell a story. And I remember I was having this conversation, I'm, I'm an, a University of Oxford fellow, and every year they have like an annual 
lunch where all the Oxford fellows come together and have a conversation. And one of the conversations we were having was about legitimacy. And the question was, what legitimizes a business and what legitimizes a person? And I think I was like, do you know what? I've, I've definitely seen both sides of the coin. I know I've been called into situations because I'm palatable, whether it's because it's a white organization and they see me as black, whether it's a white organization and they see me as representing a bunch of races, whatever it might be. I know that's the case, but my legitimacy doesn't come from what I look like. My legitimacy comes from what I do, what I deliver when I'm invited into these places. And I think when people are having the colorism conversation, it's very easy. And I see it all the time, people turning around and saying, oh, she only got that opportunity because she's mixed race. She's only DJing at this place because she's mixed race. She's only doing this because she's got free privilege, whatever these things are. And sometimes it is the case, but oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes that person is very, very good at what they do. And actually, I think it's very destructive if that is the narrative we jump to straight away because someone might have worked so, so, so hard to get somewhere. And then you're turning around and saying, oh, it's just because you're pretty. That's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair and it's not right. And I think what then we have to do is focus on the delivery. If cool, someone got through the door, however they got through the door, what do they do when they're there? How do they deliver? Is it worth their opportunity? Are they worth their opportunity? And I think asking myself that, especially during the wave of diversity and inclusion, I realise actually, call me in for whatever reasons you call me in for. I know that I deliver when I go on stage. I know that I can tell a good story. I know that I'm good at what I do. I know that if someone didn't like poetry before they came to this event, there's a chance they might be into poetry after I perform. Um, and it took me a long time to get to that point. You know, I was I was shy of admitting <laughs> that for a long time, but that serves no one, you know. Can you, you mentioned, uh, you know, you can tell a good story. What role do you think storytelling has in trying to drive the sort of change you're trying to drive with the work you do? I think if you can encourage someone to tell their story it's kind of like um you we've all been angry at someone before right and you're angry 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 but you're not having a conversation with them you haven't spoken to them and then the moment you have that conversation it's like you diffuse <laughs> it's kind of like you know it wasn't so bad <laughs> they're, they're not evil after all but the longer you put off that conversation it can just fester and grow and dig but actually, I think if you can have that conversation and you can understand someone's why, you're less inclined to judge them. Kind of like my neighbour, you know, um, if she had just called me coloured out of nowhere, I would have been annoyed. Me understanding her background, understanding her history, understanding that she comes from a family that has gone through so much racial like discrimination in the space of Judaism, in the space of being Jewish, um, she they were just trying to stay alive they are not keeping up with what's the right or wrong thing to call a black person like that has, that is the least of their concerns um so i think if you can make space to hear someone's story you're less inclined to judge them for doing the thing they do and if you do still find yourself judging the thing they do at least you have a reason you know yeah yeah definitely and then in, in, all, in that what i'm hearing you say is that it just helps you to empathize with other people and their perspectives as well um it's yeah. easy to look at things through your own perspective but then to to really truly really understand and to try and drive some change you know you've got to understand where other people are coming from and to understand how all of their life experiences and how everything they've been through have played into who they are today and their views and their thoughts and how they talk and everything like that um mm -hmm. and I th yeah i feel that in all of us doing a bit more of that understanding each other some more and telling our stories understanding our backgrounds we can just you know have a more empathetic society more inclusive world a fairer world for everyone um and it's as simple as that i know it sounds kind of uh maybe wishy-washy but it's very tangible i think and i think we need to do more to share more stories as much as possible especially from people whose stories aren't typically uh, shared as much as they should be yeah yeah we, I live, agree. In, we live in a multicultural society so I think it's super important. Um, with you, can you talk about any kind of a particularly difficult experience that poetry and spoken word has helped you to navigate? Um, probably heartbreak, to be honest. <laughs> probably heartbreak. I think I've always felt extremely big emotions. Like I've always been called sensitive in my family. My mom's always said, when, if I'm really happy or really sad, both ways, she said, you cannot be so emotional <laughs> when you're happy you should not be bouncing from wall to wall to wall if when you're sad it's like the whole world has crashed around you like the sun can be shining and I just don't see it um 
So I've always had like really, really big emotions. And I think poetry has been my outlet. And um, the reason why I think heartbreak has actually been the best place is but kind of like journaling. When you're writing about how you feel, chances are you might just stumble upon the reason that you feel the way you feel. And if you've found your reason, you can kind of find your solution. You know, if I'm heartbroken because I feel like he doesn't find me attractive, maybe I can find the solution. Maybe it's self-esteem on my part. Maybe I should brush my hair. Do you know what I mean? It could be anything. It could be so many things. But I think when you, you can sometimes write yourself into an answer. And I think if you can write yourself into an answer, you can write yourself into some kind of temporary relation or some peace. Um, and I think in the space of heartbreak, poetry has saved me so many times. <laughs> how do you manage balancing that vulnerability and... Uh, yeah, how do you manage balancing that vulnerability with trying to protect your privacy and, and personal boundaries? I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. I go on stage sometimes and I get off stage like, bro, why did you say I said too much. I yeah. <laughs> did way too much. Like, I overshare so much. And I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. And can you share one of your favourite poems and the story behind one, behind that? Uh, poems from someone else or poems from me? Oh, from yourself. Any piece, poems, spoken words? Um, there's a poem in, I don't even know why I really like it. I think there's a poem in my new collection. Um, I think it's called an I Every Island Leads Two. Maybe I have it here, actually. Every Island Leads Two. Um, and it's basically about the feeling of holding a child inside you um, and remembering that there's this life inside me that came from union. And I think the poem for me is a reminder that union and relationships are the essence of life, quite literally. One person cannot make a life, two people can make a life. And I'm not, when I say life, I'm not just talking about a child. I think union is the essence of life. Um, and I think the other reason I love it is when I was writing it, I was writing it in the voice of Beyonce. Like, you know how Beyonce talks sometimes? Mm. Sometimes in her like um, visual album, she's saying a poem and the way that she says it, she's like, for nine months I carried you the poem I think I love the way that Beyonce speaks when she's reading a poem and I kind of wrote it with her voice in mind um and then also like I've never carried a child so I was kind of just guessing how it would feel um but then my friends read it who were pregnant and they were like yes like this is this is a great poem it's really accurate and I think I love it for that <laughs> cool all good uh, can you tell me about a time where you've had to use your voice to stand up for something you believe in and what that experience was like and what it taught you um, there's been a few, but I think most recently, um, I had a situation with a work thing and I had to, I had to really check my heart was in the right place. I kind of knew where I stood on the subject matter, um, in my heart of hearts, like I knew my initial instinct, but I really had to check where that came from. Was I deciding not to do something because I was scared? Was I deciding not to do something because I was being judgmental? Was I deciding not to do something because I was being discriminatory? Or was I deciding not to do something because I knew my heart was in the right place, I knew I wasn't discriminatory, but it was just not my place to have that conversation and it was actually for someone else's stage to have that conversation. Um, and it was a really difficult situation. The situation was really difficult with a lot of people involved, a lot of moving parts, but... I think, yeah, I think I just had to sit with myself and really do a heart check and realise, no, I, I do, I know why I believe the things that I believe in, because I know the power of giving a voice back to a community. And if I'm not part of that community, I should not be the voice giving back to it. Um, yeah. Great. Perfect. All right, Sophia. And as we're planning to wrap up now, final question for you. What advice would you give to someone who's trying to drive change in their life or in their community? Um, someone said to me, Renell Shaw said to me the other day, you have to care about the future so much that you are prepared to do everything you can today and perhaps not even see the results tomorrow. And I think remembering that what we're doing here is legacy work and it's so that our grandchildren will not have to have the conversations or do the things that we're doing now. I think it's putting your heart in a place to care so much about the future that you can make the change today. 
Perfect. All right, great. That's that, man. 1000 Voices interview wrapped up. Thank you for coming on. Like, really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing all your insights and everything, man. It's been amazing. So thank you once again for coming to the podcast, Sophia. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Devin. <laughs> yeah, all good. All good. As we're wrapping up, have you got uh, any final words? And also, if people want to keep up to date with you and your work, how can they best do so? Um, Instagram. Uh, I've got some poems on YouTube as well. Just my name, Sophia Thacker. I've got a lot of poetry on YouTube. Um, I tend to like update things on my Instagram. Um, I would say Twitter, but my Twitter is a bit. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and I've got books. I've got like four books out. So there's there's more of me in all of them. Cool. All right, that's that. So thank you for coming to the podcast once again, Sophia. Amazing to have you on. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast already, please do subscribe and then leave us a comment or a review. It really helps with getting these amazing stories out as far and wide as possible. So please do like, subscribe, and then share this with your friends and get them to like, subscribe, and share with their friends. And let's get the ball rolling. But that's that for now. Thank you for coming to the podcast, Sophia. This Thank is 1000 Voices. We had the amazing Sophia Takur on the podcast. And for now, people, we're up. Thank you. Woo.